welcome everybody to our uh, fishbowl discussion today. Uh, typically, I would like to, uh, I would start an event like this by thanking our sponsor, the uh, McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture, but I'm not going to do that today, so that, that didn't happen. Instead, let me start by saying, uh, warning, this fishbowl may contain material you disagree with or find offensive. It may provoke a strong reaction, making you feel angry or exposed. But this is a fishbowl. Shouldn't you expect provocation and unpleasant ideas? Isn't that the point? Well, we're going to find out today, hopefully. Um, trigger warnings provide advance notice about the intent to cover sensitive material that may cause trauma to students who have personal experience with that material. What is the obligation of of a college or someone who directs the Center for Teaching. And to examine that today, under the auspices of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture, we've assembled a panel. Uh, starting to my left is Dr. Matthew Elliott uh, of the Counseling Center and also a lecturer in psychology, Professor Lisa Fluett from the English Department, Professor Allison Ludden from the Psychology Department, uh, Professor Jeff Bernstein from the Philosophy Department, who is joining us today even though he's a bit under the weather. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, Professor Ann Sheehy from Biology. Uh, and so let me start out uh, first with, uh, with, with you, Matt. Okay. It, 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 um, is there a real danger here? I mean, is it really students who have, who have had experiences that they really are susceptible to trauma given what can take place in a classroom? Uh, I think the short answer to that, based on my experience, not only as a therapist, but also in the classroom, is yes, I do. I do. And there's, there are certain uh, traumatic histories that people come to college with, or, you know, uh, an experience that, that was profound to them at some point in their life, where something that gets brought up in the course of a class uh, can have uh, a triggering effect. Uh, on their their uh, post trauma reaction, so I've I've seen it happen. Uh, I've certainly experienced it from the perspective of the student who's had it happen to him or her as a therapist, but also uh, in the context of the classroom. So there are students that this is real. They are in danger. They are at risk. <coughs> yes, they're at risk of experiencing some kind of post traumatic response because of something that might come up. Well, well, Jeff, let me ask you, do faculty, what are our obligations, morally and ethically, to these students who, we, who may or may not be in our classroom? Do we have a responsibility? We, we do have a responsibility, and it's an interesting question. As I was preparing for this, I was thinking, do I, in some sense, already do this or an equivalent to this, right? Whenever we're talking about a potentially upsetting topic, I usually mention it at some point or bring it into the discussion. In philosophy, it's kind of easy to do that. You can say, if you're teaching Heidegger well, Heidegger for a short period of time was a Nazi. Does this affect his philosophy? And you can kind of make it part of the class. But do we have a responsibility to <clears throat> go further and, and think of it in terms of trigger warnings? Here, here's the question I'd like to ask, if I might, to everyone. I, I'm kind of a big picture thinker, <clears throat> so uh, the series of questions in my mind would run something like this. Is PTSD a problem in the academy? You've already said yes. I think the fact that we're here suggests that we're at least potentially on board with that. Um, what are the different ways to deal with it? Are, is, there, is it enough to say in a class, okay, when we get to this point, this is going to be discussed. Is that okay? Or does it need to, do we need to have a message on the syllabus, a message on books? So what are the alternatives to it? Um, what does it require from the professors? I ask that not in the sense of, well, how much work do I have to put in, but in the sense of, are we equipped to deal with this? If PTSD is a diagnostic condition, then uh, it strikes me that putting a label on a book or a syllabus is really like putting a bandage on a tumor. We would need, if, if, if it's really a serious issue and professors need to be involved in it, it seems to me that we would need to have training in this. Now, are professors able to be trained in this? I don't know. Um, so my concern is not so much that somehow 
this would get into the issue of, well, anything that gets offensive is problematic, which I think is a red herring. Because we're not simply, I mean, it might be argued that the academy is the place specifically where you're able to offend people in a safe way. Um, but uh, are we actually trained? But, but apparently not. I mean, maybe the issue is that's an assumption that maybe if it was true, is no longer true. Uh, Allison, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm imagining that, that, uh, that you teach courses and uh, it's obvious from their title that there are issues involved. Mm -hmm. uh, is that enough when students walk in your class? Or do you have an obligation? Or what's your practice? What have you done? What okay. do you do? Okay, I think one thing that we, we need to talk about here if we're talking about trigger warnings, I think we have to talk about, well, what's a trigger? Um, and I think one of the things that, um, you know, one of the problems here is that when we're thinking particularly about PTSD and, you know, some of the, you know, um, re, um, some of the problems that kids may have, um, is that the triggers are often unexpected. So for something like PTSD, so if we're talking about maybe an, an assault, that the trigger wouldn't necessarily be seeing an assault or, a, a, or reading about an assault in a novel. It may be simply seeing somebody with a red shirt like your attacker, that, you know, the person that attacked you. So I think that it's important, you know, and, and, it's, and those kinds of triggers, you know, we may not think about, and they're gonna come up in our classroom without us even knowing that, that it's happening. And, and the people People who have experienced the trauma may actually not know what those triggers are until they are triggered. Okay. On, on so, that point alone, is, is, is Allison, you agree? I do agree. Okay, yeah. so, so okay. you agree with that. So, that right. point, yeah. so I want to move to practice. So one of the things that I do do in my classroom is talk about triggers. Not, you know, I don't provide trigger warnings, but I talk about triggers at the beginning of the semester in two ways. I mean, first, um, I, I, um, I talk about what, what are my expectations for classroom discussion. So um, first off, since I teach courses on um, adolescence and I teach courses on resilience, I need students to know that it's not expected that they will bring their personal stories to the classroom. And that's not a requirement kind of for discussion, that everybody needs to talk about the different things that happened to them that were traumatic or positive um, during <coughs> adolescence, that for the most part, we're gonna be analyzing um, research or talking about case studies but that it's not necessary for you to provide the case study. Okay, so, um, and then also I talk specifically about triggers um, and help students understand what a trigger is. And I define it for them. I actually, in some classes I use, I have a handout that I use called Responding to Triggers. And we talk about what a trigger is. A trigger is, I can read it from the top of this handout, is something that, uh, that an individual says or does or an organizational policy or practice that makes us, as members of social groups, feel diminished, offended, threatened, stereotyped, discounted, or attacked. So there are a lot of different things that can trigger. I mean, we've used the word offend here, right. so people may be offended. People may just have an undesired un, um, or unexpected emotional response. So there are a lot of different things that can trigger. Um, but then also to understand um, that we need a classroom climate that's respectful, where people think about what they say before they say it. So I mean, I'm often worried about people um, triggering each other. So assuming that everybody's experiences are the same and then saying something that may be offensive to um, one or more people in the room. So I think it's important to set a climate um, in the classroom that relates to classroom discussion, that relates to interactions, maybe even emails, just talking about the different ways that you communicate maybe, maybe and being I'm respectful. Something. Yeah. Part of your definition seemed to imply that the trigger is something that the person who hears something responds to. And earlier you said it may be something innocuous like a red sweater. Right, right. But how then can the other people in the room be aware of those things not to do that? It seems like that's right. an impossible task. Right. So, so what is the obligation? I mean, so you're telling me, I got, I'm not putting together the two things you said. Right, I think that's what's hard about it, is that we don't know when um, you know a triggered response can happen. So I think that, um, you know we, that there are particular things that that we know are likely to elicit a response. So if we, if I'm talking about particular topics, to let students know um, in advance as much as I can the kinds of of topics that we're going to be talking about. But then I think it's uh, you know, and so those are you know, so we have like there, I, I kind of I guess maybe there are three different types. So there's there's one that there, there's nothing we can do about. We never know when that will happen. And I think that if you can just create an atmosphere where students feel comfortable with each other and feel comfortable with the. 
professor that and feel comfortable kind of leaving the room or exiting when they need to um, I think that that's important for that first one for the second one it's going to be you know topics that come up that may elicit um, you know if you're talking about a particular novel or a particular topic in the classroom um, ethical issue that there's um, that we that students are aware of it and have as much knowledge as they can and understand what the expectations are regarding classroom discussion and then the third one is just simply being for me are um, you know uh, creating um, an environment where um, students feel or, or, or where students monitor kind of their their own kind of responses to each other so they're the triggers that happen interpersonally where you may disrespect someone uh, by making references to um, or stereotypes about a particular group or characterize the experiences of um, a large group of people and apply that to individuals or things like that that may um, offend that kind of offend people part so I think it's hard I think it's complex so, so Sorry, Lisa, you know, in, um, <laughs> in, in, in the teaching of literature or teaching of Montserrat, right. um, is what, what Allison said useful to you? Is that, that similar to what your practice is? Or, or, or do you have different, uh, a different way of handling such things? Well, I don't use trigger warnings um, in, in any way. And, and I, um, it, it's interesting to think about because I, I teach uh, what I would consider a lot of offensive content in that I teach about violence in literature as it's depicted. So, for example, in my Montserrat course called Crime and Punishment, um, I didn't warn students that in every one of these novels somebody is killed horribly and we're going to talk about you know, the depiction of murder in, say, Crime and Punishment, the novel, or The Big Sleep, or what have you. So, I mean, I, in a sense, you know, there's, um, I, I, I uh, in some ways, it didn't seem like as though I should have to <laughs> prepare everyone to, to know that's the case. Um, I also, I, personally, I think that um, the language of, of being offended ought to be distinguished in some ways from what is trauma-inducing, I guess. I, 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 uh, I had a, a quote that I brought with me today uh, that I brought from a, a wise person. Just because you're offended doesn't mean you're right, which is uh, actually from the comedian Ricky Gervais. Very, very, very committed to offending people. Very wise. And, and very wise as well. But the point being that, that taking offense is, is sort of neither right or wrong. It's, um, it also isn't evidence that you've had a thought about what has provoked you. It's, it's, um, it can be the occasion for thought. And I think it should be. But it's not already kind of evidence of thought. And so in some ways, uh, catering to or preparing people for what might offend them in the content of my courses is, is something that I don't do because I, I, I would rather talk about what they find offensive and what, how it can be an occasion for thought than other ones. <coughs> what you've described in terms of students um, you know, talking about uh, you know, protected speech in the classrooms, to me that's very different. It seems like uh, that is something to, I mean, I do have a, a kind of clause in my syllabus about um, uh, you know, uh, how uh, the, the classroom is kind of a space of protected speech, but not a, a space where you just willingly attack you know, it's not, you're not protected in attacking another student or treating their opinion as stupid or whatever. And I mean, to me, uh, interpersonal relations between students and what can happen as a consequence of their being in a classroom thinking and talking about, uh, that can lead to effects that are somewhat different from simply uh, teaching offensive right. content, not say, warning them. When you say you rather talk about these things uh, as they come up, aren't you really going beyond your training as a professor of literature, are you stepping into Matt's field and, and therapy in the classroom? No, I, um, <coughs> I mean, uh, to the extent that, I mean, in, say in teaching a novel like The Big Sleep, uh, you know, it, it's pretty clear, I think, in my conversation that, you know, I, I think murder is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> they should probably think that, too. No, I understand. And, and like, you, know, <laughs> you think if, if, if that, that what happened is they're taking offense, and maybe they're taking offense, maybe they are responding, and maybe they are responding and they are traumatized. And you don't have the training, I don't think, to diagnose that. I mean, is, is what she's saying good enough, in your opinion? Uh, I think given the, the class that Liz is teaching and the way in which she wants to, yes, I think it is good enough. Um, I can only really base it on, I mean, Allison's talking specifically about her class. Let me tell you a little bit about my class. Uh, which I taught for 15 years. It's called The Psychology of Modern Interpersonal Relationships. And the second half of the class is called The Dark Side of Close Relationships, which includes, as, as you probably might guess, things about uh, stalking, um, 
uh, extreme forms of jealousy, uh, rape, sexual assault, domestic violence, and those sorts of things. So I make a point partly because of the background that I come from to meet with all my students before they all let them into class to, in a sense, review the syllabus, uh, just so that they know what the topics are. I don't ask any specific questions about trauma history, but in a sense what I'm doing is giving them fair warning about the content that's to be discussed. I take it a step further, and in my first class, I let them know that when we get to the second part of the class, we will be discussing these things. So there's, in a sense, warning, if you want to call it that, number two. Uh, and then as we, the day before the class, before we actually get into the issues on rape and sexual assault, I say that again. Now, what I'm encouraging people to do is to be very acutely aware that we're about to enter into discussion about these things, and I'm aware that in a class of 14 women, for instance, there may be two or three of uh, you here who have had experiences that will um, uh, be similar to the things that we're talking about. I encourage you, if you would like to talk about this with somebody, anybody of your choosing, if you go ahead and do that, or at least very much uh, prepare yourself for the fact that we're going to have this discussion. If you're like not able to, uh, you can come and talk to me uh, uh, during office hours. And in 15 years of actually having that conversation, I've never actually had somebody opt out of a class. Have I had people who've been affected by what we've talked about? For sure. But uh, I'm hoping that they weren't as affected because, in a sense, I gave them a kind of warning, perhaps not the trigger warnings that uh, we're alluding to here, as defined by the AAUP, but a kind of warning that gave them time to think about and prepare themselves emotionally for that discussion. And, and partly, I mean, I'm purposeful in that because I, I do uh, value um, the freedom to be able to talk about things that are disturbing. So, Anne, you've now heard four people talk about their practice in the classroom and their various definitions of, of what the issues are. Uh, I'd like to bring you in by asking you sort of two questions. One, what are the topics that you discuss and deal with in the classroom? in which this is a relevant conversation and what your practice is uh, before you've been exposed to these other suggestions and ideas. Um, yeah, so I often counter the question of why the heck are you here? So um, I'll answer that one first. Um, <laughs> I teach a course that is a non-majors course that primarily focuses on the science of HIV AIDS, um, but we do deal with a number of political, economic, uh, psychological, social aspects of a pandemic in which these topics would come up. Um, we don't do any discussion, and so I would say that the trigger warnings that have sort of been a hot topic recently in academia are not, are not necessarily something that I encounter on a daily basis, because when we talk in the classroom, it's a very objective, um, somewhat more scientific approach. Um, and it wouldn't be on um, necessarily perhaps a sexual assault that led to a transmissive event or something like that. Um, but I do have the students submit written work, um, sort of journal entry style type things where the dialogue is really between me and them and not a, a wider range. And then certainly in some of those submissions, it is quite clear from some of the topics that have come up in class, so the one that I think of you know, most easily is I tell students that if they, are, regardless of whether a man or a woman, if they are sexually assaulted, from my scientific aspect, the most important thing that they should do is go on antiretroviral therapy within 24 hours. And I can scientifically tell them why. Um, and certainly, students who have experienced a sexual assault will occasionally write in their journals commenting on that and they wish that they had known that, whatever. Now whether that they're actually experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder or any kind of um, you know, sort of unpleasant flashback to something or even you know, reflecting forward in what if this were to happen, um, that is a conversation that typically can continue and certainly I have had students continue that conversation in the environment of an office, like my office. We don't deal with those types of things um, in the open classroom. Purely from the standpoint that I have no education in how to, you know, sort of how to dial down a response that may be um, sort of feeding forward. I'm not trained in that. I avoid that at all costs. I avoid it by not putting trigger warnings but just trying to confine 
my syllabus to what I'm good at, which is, which is scientific. Although I think it's really valuable to invest in these other aspects of HIV um, and the sexual components of that and drug use and that sort of sex, drugs, and rock and roll kind of thing. It is valuable, um, but most of that dialogue occurs in a written format. But what I will say, um, and I, I see it all the time, is that students write from a perspective without knowing that they are offensive. Um, and so I can see the value of having some of this discussion in an open classroom because the word, they don't, they, at the age of 17, which a lot of my students are, they don't realize that the words that they choose convey a value judgment. And so they're approaching it from a, an aspect of they think they're conveying something objective so for instance, again, the most common thing that I see is that homosexual men have spread this epidemic globally. And that's not something I just encountered 10, 10 years ago in that discourse. Um, and so for me, what I do is I turn that and say, well, where are you getting that information? Like, where's your citation? Where's the words for that? Um, because I don't think they really, I don't think they <coughs> see that as something that's offensive to any particular demographic. They see that as a fact. And so, um, from that aspect, I deal with it mostly in a written format. It's pretty rare for us to, there's, there are a few instances of where we've encountered discussions. So for instance, one of the hot topics, which anybody is from my class, we're gonna talk about it tomorrow. Um, one of the hot topics working its way through Congress is whether the ban on blood donations from men who I self-identify as men who have sex with men, whether that ban should continue or are we actually discriminating against that population in a societal way. Um, and that's come up in Congress again. So that does have the potential to be offensive and discriminatory and may trigger some things. I do not plan to warn the students in, the, in any aspect, mostly because, and this could be a purely subjective thing, I think that most of the things that I deal with, because they've been taken off reputable websites, whether that be a newspaper or peer reviewed journal, these are things that my students are going to have to deal with out there, out there regardless of whether that's walking across campus with peers that may have more discrimination than they do, may, sh may just have different views, or whether it's out there in the community of Worcester or out there from where they're from. But my, I see part of my job is to offer you know, a somewhat safer environment, but it can't be a padded room environment because eventually you are out there. And so um, I, you know, I try to minimize that risk for them, but I do not, um, I don't use trigger warnings. Okay, so um, I'm a physicist by uh, training and, and by choice, and so I like to work by induction. So I'm listening to what the five of you said, and, and I'm able to make some conclusions. One is there are a lot of wonderful professors at Holy Cross. Uh, and they just don't happen to be on this panel. That's <laughs> the that. I know. And they happen to be on this panel. <laughs> um, but also, it, 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 it's also very clear that each of you is um, has thought about this, and you're content with your approach. <laughs> and you seem to be saying that uh, maybe Holy Cross, as an institution, uh, should just let you do your jobs, and there needs to be no policy at Holy Cross uh, or, or to inform you and tell you what you ought to do and not to do in, in this regard. One, I want to hear back, am I hearing you correctly? And if I am, are you really comfortable with that? I think that you're not hearing us correctly, um, but I think there's a way in which what you're saying obviously touches on it. I, I'll try and answer this by going back to the question of offense. Just as a philosopher, I sometimes use Venn diagrams when I teach logic, which is not frequently, but it seems that we can say that triggers can be offensive, right? They can be due to offensiveness, but not all offensiveness is a trigger, right? Everyone here has said as far as I can tell, that we all have a desire to create a safe space that allows one to deal with issues that are not inherently safe, right? Um, to the extent that we are all interested in that, it sounds to me that everyone's open to talking about those kind of things. It, and, and to the extent that that occurs on, on an administrative level, on a faculty level, that's that's fine. I don't mean to be speaking for everyone, but it's the sense I get. What I personally would object to is someone said, the idea of a trigger warning as a verbal or written well, statement. Someone, <coughs> your dean or your president or your department chairperson. It would, it, the problem I would have with any of them saying that is that 
there are so many things that need that that get presumed in that that I would want to have a discussion about it. So it, it seems to me, so one thing that, that hasn't been mentioned yet, but I would say in, along with what you're saying is I think that a proactive statement prior to uh, creating a safe space in a, in a classroom occurs over time. This is one of the reasons why I love teaching in Montserrat because you have more time to do that, right? Um, that's something that's practical. It happens over time. And it happens not by statements. It happens by just kind of being with people, having discussions, seeing what your students are like. Uh, <clears throat> to proactively, before that occurs, put on a trigger warning. My worry is that it provides something like an occasion for anticipatory anxiety. That seems to go against the kind of safe space that one wants to, that everyone here says they want to bring about in a classroom. So that would be my concern. It's not that I have a problem with all administrators or my dean or my chair telling me what to do. It's that insofar as we're the ones in the classroom, there would need to okay. be so. so I'm trying to bring a nuanced thing to that. Well, let me then go back to you, Allison. What do you think is uh, acceptable for your chair or your dean to say to you uh, or say to the faculty with respect to trigger warnings? And Jeff said where they should go is too far. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I mean, I think it, go, coming back to the idea that we may not all agree about what are the triggers. I mean, I think that's part of the problem is that, um, you know, what I started off with is that the triggers take a lot of different forms. So that to say something like, um, we should have a trigger, you know, a trigger warning, or we should consider trigger warnings, or given your course, you should, you know, design an appropriate trigger warning. I, I just don't think that we would all agree about what triggers are. So I don't think that um, a trigger warning is appropriate. But I think that, um, you know, and I, the idea of working from a safe. I mean, we've all mentioned safe space um, and creating an environment that um, that protects students. Um, and um, allows them to, um, uh, to allows them um, to develop the kind of the, com the communication with both each other and with you, and our, uh, and make connections to appropriate resources should they need them. I think that thinking about those things in a syllabus is important, um, but defining you know that every person should have a um, you know, a trigger warning um, doesn't make sense given that we wouldn't all agree upon what the, you know, what a well, definition is. Matt, given the limits of what you can say, mm -hmm. are you aware, and it doesn't have to be a whole across, are you aware of cases in colleges on other <laughs> campuses where a professor was not as good and careful as the people in the room and they stepped over a line, a line we don't know where it belongs yet, but they've gone too far and they are um, culpable for what they did. I mean, anecdotally, yes, I'm very aware of that happening um, here and at other places. So, and I think that's because typically somebody hasn't taken care to think hard about the kind of material that they're encouraging their students to engage to read, but also to engage, and I think much more of professor who perhaps naively, perhaps by philosophy, encourages people to write a personal essay about an experience that is traumatic by anybody's standards. Oh, okay, so there, there certainly, you see there are, should we call them legitimate abuses, or mistakes made. M mistakes made, mistakes yeah, made. I think sometimes my guess is, my guess is that it's more out of naivete than, okay. than philosophy well, then teaching. I, I, I mean, um, anyone, what does the college have a responsibility to do to deal with that naivete? Every year, there are 10 new faculty, let's say. There are adjectives that come here. And uh, I'm not aware that at any time that the people that are responsible for the, bringing those people into Holy Cross say, and now here's our official position, our discussion on trigger warnings. Do we just sort of uh, uh, close our eyes and hope that they figure it out? Well, I, I don't think that trigger warnings as such need to be codified into some kind of official faculty policy. That I wouldn't want to see, because I think that based on what we're saying, we'd essentially have to put a trigger warning on every single class that people I mean, That seems to be my conclusion, as naive as it might be. But I do think that 
I do think that professors ought to be encouraged in some fashion, perhaps by the department chair, perhaps by the college, to be aware of this kind of uh, this construct, this, this the possibility that if you're going to ask students to <coughs> comment on formally, require them to reveal things about themselves, you need to give them an adequate amount of uh, warning space to do that. Or consider not doing it at all if the risk seems to outweigh the positive. All right. Lisa, now uh, you're part of the chair, and you're dealing with some new hires, and, and, and you want to do right by them, you, you know, you, so uh, uh, do you feel that anything needs to be said, or you uh, think I, that by looking at your materials, you're comfortable that, that they're where they need to be in terms of this? Well, if I'm in charge, <laughs> I, I am, in charge. Uh, I'm not making distinctions between new hires and present faculty in order to, if I were going to say anything at all, okay, I wouldn't. Okay. Put it, I wouldn't put it out there that, you know, in terms of the new people, they need to know this and not make it a general pronouncement. But I, I am not sure I, um, I agree the assignments that you're describing, the, the, the personal essay, that's very different from anything you do with a student. And, and I, I do think it's naive to put that kind of an assignment out there and not, uh, you know, warn students about, you know, just, to, I, I guess, uh, not warn students about, uh, you know, the, the possibility that they could uh, you know, bring something up that might be hurtful to them or, or someone else and so on. Um, so I do think those kinds of assignments, uh, you know, should be girded around, not with maybe trigger warnings, but just with you know, practical <coughs> warnings about uh, what can happen. Um, but I, uh, in terms of how one would approach uh, faculty from a position of authority, I, I, I don't think I would make a general pronouncement, and I certainly <coughs> wouldn't distinguish uh, between new and <coughs> faculty in order to well, I appreciate that, but it just seems to me that, that everyone is <coughs> saying there can be mistakes made, but nobody wants to offer something to do to avoid those mistakes. Not true. We can assume here that, that Tom might have asked me to lead this discussion because I'm known to be offensive, and now here's a chance <laughs> to uh, give me the instruction I need. Matt, Make me a better, a here's, better teacher. here's what you need to do. Yeah. You need to actually speak with some of these people who actually know the data and know the information on trigger warnings, and then you, as I your capacity in the Center for Teaching, need to go and evaluate and check out what our demographic is, get a sense of the growing amount, if there is a growing amount of people who have PTSD, and make that information available to all of us. I would be in favor of that coming from whatever source. Uh, I have no desire to be, I mean, the, the, the example that you gave sounds quite naive to me too. But I, I would have no desire to even get close to that wire tripping. Uh, so I would be very interested in having information uh, communicated to us if it is the kind of problem that we're uh, presupposing it is. That seems to me the first step, regardless of whatever goes on after. Okay, but I'm trying to work and find out what the boundary is. I know that we all object to the idea of someone forcing us to put labels on courses, and we know what abuse that does, and I'm with you, okay? I mean, I have, uh, I have my George McGovern credentials, I got that, okay? But the real question is, on the other side of that line, what can we start to do, what can we start to say? And I'm still hearing um, nothing very concrete about how we bring new people into uh, into our college, how we bring them into our department, how we even have any information out there on the web or on my website. I mean, uh, and I'm looking, so where can you push the envelope or where can you push the line with not crossing over it? Or is it not important to do that? I, um, in terms of, I would tend to think that um, de dealing with, I mean, I actually have had experiences in classes where um, students have been have experienced you know, trauma as a result of what we are reading, and um, I, without going into it beyond anecdotally, I, I, I think that faculty tend to want to deal with that kind of thing on a case by case sort of basis rather than a policy basis. In other words, um, the preemptive warning to me seems to make no sense because 
I, I don't necessarily feel as though warning a student in advance uh, helps them to deal with the potential for trauma in any way. Um, but if you know, the trauma occurs, then um, you know, we have strategies for dealing with it. Right? You know, we, we know that we're not therapists, but clearly other people on campus are, and, and that's where you know, we direct students to go. But I, mean, I, I guess case-by-case case solutions, as opposed to radical policy changes, would be where my opinion would be on, on, on where the boundaries should be. Yeah. <clears throat> Being on the Student Life Committee, I found it very helpful to get this kind of, in to, to find out what's going on in the Counseling Center. What are they seeing at the Counseling Center to under better understand kind of my role in relation to the Counseling Center, so as a faculty member. And I think that kind of information would be very helpful to faculty in a, uh, you know, new faculty, kind of one of the seminars or one of the, you know, workshops that you have for incoming faculty to understand kind of the, the different types of experiences that students have had, how this may come up in the classroom, how this may relate to what you're teaching, um, and help, you know, help work with faculty to think about, well, in what ways might you encounter um, these, you know, re-experiencing of a traumatic event um, amongst your students. So. Uh, this is something that good teachers have somehow get to. They get to the point where they can anticipate these things and manage them, and then the only job the rest of us have is to do the best job we can at hiring <coughs> and <coughs> tenuring good people. And that the problem takes care of itself within our rubric of what good teaching is. Is that enough? I think providing information is more important than you seem in your persona as the offensive traumatic moderator <laughs> to be willing to grant. I, I think that information, provi providing information should not just be from the faculty. If this is a problem, we should be getting notes, as we do in other cases, saying this person has X. Or if it doesn't work like that, then we at least need to understand that the people who may have PTSD don't necessarily know that they have it. Uh, there's a lot of ways to bring this information about that at least starts a climate or a culture of taking issues seriously. And that, I think, happens on a case-by-case -case basis. It happens through different organizations. I don't think it happens through one word from on high. It may get to the point where policy decisions get made, but that comes after a lot of information. We may not have <coughs> one word coming from on high, but we do collaborate and produce documents. There, the college has a mission statement. Uh, the college has many such statements about that, that articulate uh, our ideas and our standards. <coughs> and um, if I'm gathering from, uh, from the five of you here, um, the issue of this issue of triggers is such that we clearly want to err on the side of not being too restrictive and getting into the label making business. And that seems to be enough. I mean, am I missing something or are you agree? Um, I, I think that people who have spoken before me. Um, and speak a little bit more intelligently about the sort of depth of what a trigger can be and, and what it means. Um, I think that it's very shaky ground to come up with a policy institution wide when we're talking about something that is a moving target. Um, and as and again, because I wear this hat so much of my life, I would say that I would agree more on the side of is this an issue that we really should be dealing with, even if it affects a small percentage. <coughs> Say one percent, half percent. If there's a if there's a cohort of individuals that are experiencing this, then as an institution, it might be something we should certainly touch on. But there are so many things that we're trying to prepare our students for that, like anything else, we have to prioritize. Um, and so I would want a little bit more information before I were to participate in a discussion on a sort of a blanket statement for new. I don't, and I certainly don't agree. It would be a new faculty thing because. I'm pretty sure, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure most of the people over in the building that I work in would not be able to define trigger warning. It is not a term that we encounter on a daily basis um, at all. Um, and whether that's because of the things that we teach and we just don't experience this or we don't see it or we don't accumulate the information, I don't know, but it's not. So I, I worry about um, trying to come up with a one-size-fits-all. I learned about it on um, Facebook. 
right? And it, and, it, and it is this moving target, particularly on when we're talking about, I mean, you're talking about a generation that certainly has more potential being involved more in war, for instance. You know, they, there's certainly more potentially of their peers from high school or something that may be considering that. Um, infectious okay, so disease. Okay. We'll take it for one more question um, <coughs> before I bring in, in the audience to ask some. But clearly, <coughs> I'm going to get the American Association of University <coughs> Professors a statement, I'll link it to the Center for Teaching's website, and I've, I've, I've met Jeff's charge to do something. But um, what are you afraid of in going too far? In other words, what is your fear against the idea of, uh, of a mandated trigger <coughs> warning? What's the harm? My worry is twofold. It, it puts a responsibility, and at this point, an administratively binding responsibility, on teachers to be therapists when we're not trained to be therapists. And two, if I can remember what it was I was just about to say, it creates anticipatory anxiety, or it has the potential to create anticipatory anxiety, because if students who are already overwhelmed from orientation are now coming into a situation where they have to worry about what should be a safe space being a potentially uh, traumatic space. So uh, it simply does more <coughs> harm than <coughs> conceivable good. That's what I yeah. think. <coughs> I mean, I mean it, I just the thing, if by just by saying, you know, if, if, that, if all you have is the statement, <coughs> that's not enough. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in a sense, it's, it's an out for a professor to say, well, I warned you. Right, and, and so, and for a student, well, you warned us, so I can back out. Like, it seems like it's, it's a stand-in for something that needs to be a, a process and a communication and a safe space. Like, all the things that we're talking about, it's, it's kind of, it could potentially stand in for that when it's not actually <coughs> sufficient. Okay, okay. Well, without going any further among the group, is there people that want to sort of stick their hand in the fishbowl uh, <laughs> and, or tap the window? Is, are there any questions or comments from, from, the, uh, from the audience at this point? Sure. Yes, please. Um, so um, coming at this from the perspective, of, I'm visiting faculty this year, uh, teaching mythology course. And part of the reason I'm attending this event is because I do intend to have a Day where we talk about rape portrayals in mythology and things like that. Uh, and I guess my perspective, <coughs> I mean, I'm pretty much in agreement, I guess, with a lot of what you're saying, is that a blanket statement where like, a policy feels stifling to me as a professor, you know, it would, it would make me, it would give me more pause to, uh, before I would actually, I mean, I could teach mythology course without that day. Right? Um, but at the same time, uh, sort of these other things, this event um, and, you know, kind of opportunities for conversation among faculty or uh, information provided in a purely informational way and not as a guidelines or policies, but in a, this is what triggers might be, this might, these are some resources for teaching topics of this sort uh, would be helpful. And also as a side note, I guess, um, this does seem to be a topic among many of my graduate student colleagues and things, uh, comes up a lot, uh, like, um, or at least within the humanities fields where uh, you might want to teach these topics via literature or, or what have you. So, and it seems like, you know, we're all kind of talking to each other already in some ways, like um, Facebook feed, several people early, late August saying, any tips, people, for are you going to do this? Should I put a trigger warning on my list? Anyone have any thoughts? I don't know. It's formalizing, not formalizing, but having resources within the, the college as well as beyond just my network of friends is a helpful idea. Would, uh, the, uh, would the fish care to offer some advice here? Uh, Allison, I think, mentioned the idea of sort of formalizing uh, an orientation, certainly for new faculty, but maybe for everybody else, about the resources that do currently exist on campus to refer students to when you might be worried that uh, something's going to be triggered in some way. Uh, I think we actually do that right now, if I'm not mistaken. I know that uh, Paul Galvin Hill is the director of 
counseling and meal substance use overseas disability services will be talking to the new faculty soon during some kind of formalized orientation and they do that every year so you know if departments can chairs for instance can can um, promote that to their incoming people or visiting lecturers anybody who's new to the department I think that's a, a useful thing and it's not reinventing any sort of wheel um, there also used to be, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, I've been here a long time, but I recall that Mark Freeman used to write, or, or had a, a strong hand in writing some kind of faculty guide, and I don't know if it was designed specifically for new faculty or for faculty in general, but it was kind of a how-to, uh, how, how, to, how to navigate uh, all sorts of things that were not necessarily related to teaching your class. Uh, all the peripheral things such that you're inquiring about right now. Do you know if anybody here at the college still produces something like that, or if the document I don't exists? Know. That's a good question. <clears throat> people aren't aware, but, but I, I think people are really good about networking with other people. Uh, so it may not be seen officially, but people do talk to their chairs, they talk to their colleagues, uh, some people talk to me, they talk to Tom. There's a whole bunch of conversations that people have about how you deal with this, how would you teach this, what do you think of that, and I think that's uh, one of the uh, signs that we're doing the right type of things, uh, at least so far. Are uh, there uh, other questions? Yes, please. Hi, um, so I understand that it doesn't seem very feasible to do a trigger warning because there are so many definitions of what a trigger could be. What about, what do you guys think of doing some kind of um, sort of a warning about really just letting people know as you start the beginning of the course or something that you are going to be discussing some sort of topics and let them know that you're like, open for office hours. I think some of you have talked about that you've spoken to students in your office before open for office hours to discuss the material if it makes you uncomfortable or providing the counseling center's phone number to let them know like what do you guys because I know they did that during orientation when we had the skit about sexual assault they provided us with such numbers from the counseling center so what do you guys think of doing something like that that would kind of encompass like things that somebody had trouble with I think that's fine I mean I don't think I explicitly state it in at the beginning of my class although maybe partially um you know, the topic that I teach, the name of the class, HIV AIDS, I think I'm, I'm fairly certain 99% of the Holy Cross population realizes that there are some sensitive topics within that. Um, so no, I don't explicitly go over that, but I do explicitly cover the way it's transmitted. We talk about it on the first day. Um, and certainly I have walked students down individually to the counseling center, although I don't have the counseling center on my syllabus or anything like that. Um, but do know that number. I think it's I think it's something wise to be encouraged of professors, and particularly those professors who know that they're going to be delving into those kind of topics that societally um, are pretty sensitive. And and I think there's also a culture in which students know, or I I think I hope they know, that they have advisors, they have other professors, they have other people they know. And they can call upon them if they think that they need some assistance. And, and people learn by iteration. Uh, what I think is clear from this group is when they feel that there is such a need to put something in the syllabus, they would not consider it a trigger warning or a label, but the syllabus is made to sort of promise this is what we're going to try to learn, and this is how we're going to try to help you learn it, and here's how I've created a safe environment for the learning of that. And that process does, in some sense, it looks like this group feels that that process does more and better than any trigger warning could be mandated or voluntary. That's the way to do it. The idea is to think of safe spaces for students to work. Yes. This question over there, sir. Please. You're saying that you don't feel comfortable doing this, but what is it that you don't feel comfortable doing? Well, and 
I say this, can you at least put this quickly to one thing that you don't feel comfortable doing? Because I think there are lots of things that we don't like about the idea. I would feel uncomfortable putting next to one of the books, trigger warning, this book contains material that, that deals with violent topics or something. I remember seeing a picture uh, of, of, and I don't think it was a hoax. It was a picture of Kant's critique of pure reason, which it's 19th century, it's not exactly progressive, but on the other hand, it doesn't have anything violent in it. Um, it says, warning, this book does not conform to standards of uh, the, the 20th, first century values. It strikes me that that would be kind of anticipating something that may or may not be there, especially given that so many different things can form as a trigger. Does that make sense? Are there any other examples? Yeah, I guess I also have a problem with putting, putting labels next to like specific topics because I think it also sends a message to the students that we don't think that you know that we may not think that that they're cap you know capable or, or able to if they've had any kind of experience like that that they may think that we see them as you know, weak or vulnerable you know particularly if we're talking about um, you know I just think about the gendered nature of the issue so if it, if it's all you know if it's right next to rape or sexual assault or that we that we don't that we think that women are weak and vulnerable and not able to have these kinds of conversations and I wouldn't ever expect you to like I wouldn't want students to go in thinking oh we can't touch this topic because it's so sensitive in nature. Like, I wouldn't want students to get that message, but rather I'd want the message that you were talking about, that this is a safe space where we, you know, we can engage in, you know, in a conversation and talk about these issues um, that you know, may make us uncomfortable, but we can um, you know, work towards solutions and talk about what some of the problems are. This raises actually a very interesting issue back to what you were saying about students sometimes thinking that the language they use is somehow objective when it's really somewhat value-laden. And in fact, that is the same kind of thing could be said given what you just said about uh, labels, right? Yes. They could, they, they're, they're value-laden. Value yeah. Yes. <coughs> Weak. Vulnerable. Yeah, I have a, just a practical issue with it, and this has to do with the, the AAUP statement. And um, there's a point here, we're talking about a, a, a labeling kind of trigger warning on a syllabus where you know, uh, it says that, for example, a novel like Chima uh, Achebe's uh, Things Fall Apart might, <coughs> might trigger readers who have experienced racism, colonialism, religious persecution, violence, suicide, and more. And OK, but I mean, in, in a sense, you know, there, there's a problem you know, with, practically speaking, with, with uh, teaching fiction and warning everybody in the room of what the plot is going to entail before they've read it, first of all. And secondly, it also presupposes that there's some kind of uh, student out there who's so insulated and safe that they, they wouldn't uh, have any response to any of these topics, whether or not they'd experience them or not. And I mean, to me, that just seems, I mean, that, that's a fantasy. I mean, you, you, you should be concerned with these topics. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a mistake, I think, to, um, Imagine that there's some way that you could, as a reader, be completely insulated from caring one way or the other, or or, or having some kind of strong emotions in response to them. So, I mean, just in the terms of teaching literature, I would kind of object on those grounds. Since that's such a, a, a good answer, and because of the time, this is a great time to call the, the end of the session. I want to thank uh, thank you all for coming, and thank our, our panelists for being here. Thank you all very much.